Textbook definition of a hazardous material is basically any substance that's capable of posing unreasonable risk to health, safety, and property uh, when transported in commerce. All right, and commerce is a big part of that definition. Okay, when we're doing it to further a business or we're putting it, you know, we're giving it to a company that moves packages for business, then we have to comply with all the regulations. There's about 260 pages of what we call proper shipping names or descriptions for hazardous materials. Things you wouldn't even realize, uh, wet cotton is considered a hazardous material. Okay, I'm wearing cotton right now. You get it wet, it's a hazardous material. And this is more the raw, you know, just freshly picked cotton. It's spontaneously combustible. So if it gets hot enough, it can actually ignite on its own. So there are a lot of things that you wouldn't, you wouldn't really consider uh, to be a hazardous material that is actually hazardous materials. New employees have 90 days to be trained. If you change job functions, like if you guys go from what you're doing now to actually preparing packages or doing the documentation, then you'll need to be trained specifically in that area. At least once every three years, anything that changes will update you on any of the changes that have taken place over those three years. Awareness training is required by the DOT or the Department of Transportation. And then also, UPS has an additional requirement uh, that anybody that ships hazardous materials has to have an ongoing training program within that company in order to make sure people are doing things correct. One of the things a lot of people don't realize is when you ship a hazardous material, it's a shared responsibility. Okay, You guys are responsible for preparing it, the paperwork, the packaging, and making sure everything's on the package. UPS takes it and it's not correct. Now they share the responsibility if they get an inspection and they've got a package that's not prepared correctly, they also will face fines as well as you know violations and fines coming back to us as the preparer or the offer of that hazardous material. So they want to make sure the customers are doing things right, so they require as part of a contract that you uh, keep an ongoing training program. As far as the training goes, I want you to understand the regulations. And they're written by attorneys in Washington. There's no pictures in the book, so it's very hard to follow. And there's a lot of room for interpretation. So that's kind of what we do is, is try to clear things up specific to and tailor it to what you guys do here uh, at Fleet Pride. There are nine different classes of hazardous materials and uh, we only really have a few of those. All right? We don't carry uh, at this point any explosives. That could be anything from fireworks, ammunition, to torpedoes, dynamite, uh, C4, things like that. So it's a wide, wide range. Uh, we've got a lot of class two gases. These are our Freons, uh, any aerosol it would be considered a class two uh, compressed gas. And the aerosols can either be flammable or non-flammable. The class two is actually broken down into a few different divisions. Flammable and combustible liquids are class threes. Uh, we have quite a few of these as well. And these are our window wash cleaner, the brake antifreeze, you know, a lot of the fuel additives are flammable, uh, flammable products. Class four flammable solids. As far as the flammable solids, these would be like the, the caulk adhesives that are flammable based uh, materials. A lot of these things we ship under what we call exceptions, uh, limited quantities or ORMD. The organic peroxides and oxidizers, uh, the only thing that I saw that you guys have of those are the, um, the resin kits where you have a hardener that goes with a, you know, with a body filler. Those will all ship under ORMD. One other product that I found, this is the one that surprised me, was a filter. Okay, it was a coolant filter that actually has an anti-rust or a rust inhibitor in the filter, which is an oxidizer, and those filters are shipped as ORMDs. And I just happened to, to run across one of these in the stores, but I never would have, I don't even think they were on the list to look at. Um, so those are the kind of things that, you know, are going to surprise us that, you know, is why we need your guys' eyes on the product. Uh, to let us know if we missed something. Class 6 poisons, I don't believe there was anything uh, that we had that was considered a poison. Some of the fuel biocides can end up falling in that classification at some point. Class 7 radioactives, we don't have any of that. Class 8 corrosives, we got quite a few of these. Okay, these are the truck washes, the aluminum brighteners, the batteries, all right, these are all considered uh, corrosive materials. Okay, batteries, you know, some of them are regulated, some of them are not. It just kind of depends on, uh, on the type of battery, whether it's uh, serviceable or non-serviceable. But those are all considered class eight or corrosive materials. And class nine is miscellaneous. This is basically anything that didn't fall into the one of the other classifications, but it is considered hazardous, you know, for some reason or another, like lithium batteries. A UPS plane out in the Middle East that crashed, and that was due to lithium batteries bunch of small coin-sized batteries on a skid that weren't packaged well 
shorted out, caught on fire. You know, by the time they had taken off, filled with smoke, had a hard time finding the airport, coming back in, and end up crashing because of lithium batteries. You know, something that we use on a daily basis. You know, there's no other classification for that, so they put them under the class nine miscellaneous. So we properly package, you know, identify them, and let you know the UPS driver or whoever know that we're shipping lithium batteries. Some other materials fall in there that we carry and they're considered environmentally hazardous and they want us to identify those just in case there's a spill. We know that it's going to cost some money to clean that uh, material up out of the environment. For the most part, the classes we have are the, the gases, you know, the Freon, and we got a lot of aerosol products. Class 3 flammable liquids, that's another big one with the windshield wash, the brake antifreeze, uh, you know, those, those flammable fuel additives and then the uh, corrosive class eight. So those are really the three classifications of materials that we ship as a true hazardous material uh, out of this facility or out of any of the DCs uh, that we have currently. This is a hazardous material marking for a limited quantity. When this is on a package, we don't know, you know if it's a flammable liquid, if it's corrosive. You know, in this case, it happens to be an aerosol. When we utilize these exceptions, we kind of take away the actual product of what, it, you know, what the hazard is. But it's something that we're allowed to do as far as the regulations, and it helps facilitate the transportation because there's a lot of stuff we get out of uh, when we take these exceptions. So the old way was the RMDs, the consumer commodities. There was really no size or design requirement for these. With the new limited quantity diamonds, you know, there's a size requirement. They can't be any smaller than this on the package, and uh, they have to be the, the black and white or the, the black and corrugated diamond. So it stands out a little more, kind of like your regular hazardous material diamonds. All right, these obviously stand out real well. You see these in the warehouse, it gets your attention. I'm assuming this is probably a flammable product just based on what it is, but you can see how small that marking is. Not real easily to pick up on the box, where this limited quantity marking is much more readily visible. So these are the kind of things that we need to be looking out for, and if they're not uh, identified on the paperwork as being a, a hazardous material, whether it says HZ or RMD or HZ in a, a hazardous material code, then we need to know about it so we can get them added or get them reviewed. Uh, you know, we are looking at a product out in the warehouse where the manufacturer doesn't understand what the rules are. They've got it marked as an RMD and then they also have a flammable diamond on there. Okay, it's either one or the other. Uh, we can't do it as both. Once you take the exception, we leave the rest of that stuff off. There's a lot of confusion in this industry. And that's why, you know, the training is so important is to make sure that we do things, you know, 100% correct. You know, shipping by truck, there's some flexibility. But when you guys ship UPS, if we do hazardous materials UPS, they will not tolerate any. If you have a comma listed in here and there's no comma on the paperwork, they will refuse it. Okay, they want everything exact very strict and it's one of those things it's my trucks if you want to ship on my trucks you're going to do the way you know you're going to do it how i say or i'm not going to take your product you know as long as we're shipping in the manufacturer's case in most instances it'll already be in that un specification packaging when we take out a bottle here or there to ship to a customer that we have to make sure we repackage that into a proper hazardous material package. Packaging is a very important part of the hazardous material piece. If product's not properly packaged, the risk of transporting as well as the likelihood of it leaking uh, become much greater. Okay, so as long as we package it right, uh, we use good quality, strong packaging that hasn't been compromised, chances of it making it to a destination are much greater than if the package uh, doesn't meet standards. Hazardous materials have to go into what we call a UN spec package. And this is how you identify a UN spec package is the information on the box. The UN symbol is one of the requirements. That's, that way you know that it's actually UN spec packaging. The rest of this information tells you how the package was tested, the amount of weight we can put in it, the type of materials that are allowed to be used in this box. And the reason packaging is so important is if we could package things so well that regardless of how the packages were handled, whether it's UPS or you know the trucking companies, that they could drop that from a 23-foot conveyor and nothing spills, we wouldn't need the rest of this information. The packages have to meet a minimum standard prescribed by the DOT, and as long as they can pass what they call performance tests, then they become a certified package for hazardous materials. So any hazardous material has to be in a special packaging. And then along with that is the uh, the labels and then the marking 
the marking is just the, the name of the material and then what we call a UN number. Hazardous material packaging is based on how dangerous the product is. There's levels, what we call packing groups, and this information will show up on the, on the paperwork. But a packing group one is the most dangerous. We don't have any products that we carry that are considered packing group ones. Packing group twos and packing group threes are mainly uh, the products that we have here. Packing group two is a medium danger, three is a minor danger. And, and just to put some numbers with it, if I had a corrosive material, which is a class eight, there was a packing group one, that would do what they call irreversible skin damage. Basically, it's going to burn through your skin and leave a scar in less than three minutes. Okay, three minute exposure, it will burn through your skin. Packing group two, you have anywhere from three minutes and one second to 59 minutes, 59 seconds. All right, so it goes from three minutes to an hour. And then packing group three is anywhere from an hour up to four hours. If it takes longer than four hours to do uh, irreversible damage, and it's not considered a corrosive for DOT purposes. All right, OSHA may still consider it to be a corrosive material or an irritant, um, but as far as transportation goes, it's not a hazardous material. If I got a product that's really dangerous, I'm gonna probably have to put it in a package that's a little stronger than one that's not so dangerous, right? And that's where this performance standard comes in. You know, the packaging for packing group two materials have to go through a, a more stringent test than for packing group three materials. And then the package markings, that's the information that we're putting on the outside of the box, and there's all kinds of variations uh, of these markings. Orientation arrows, those are considered a marking. The, uh, the limited quantity marking, shipping name and UN number, those are all considered uh, markings. The RMD is a marking. Labels, those are the, uh, the 4x4 diamonds, and those are the ones that really stand out. When you see those on the boxes, they stand out and get your attention, and they're color-coded, designed. You see red, you know, it's flammable. Green, non-flammable. Black and white is more informational. They're always going to be uh, four by four diamonds. As far as the shipping paper goes, it's what's used to uh, describe the material. And that information may be the same as the product name, but in a lot of cases it's a, it's a DOT assigned, what we call, proper shipping name. For instance, break antifreeze. The DOT shipping name for that is methanol. And then along with that goes a, uh, a UN number, and that's a four digit number. You guys see them on placards of uh, trucks running around. Those are assigned only to hazardous materials. All right? So that's another way to identify hazardous materials by that four digit number. But as far as the shipping paper goes, that's just the terminology for it. UPS uses an eight-part form. For the trucks, we use a bill of lading, and here we actually use an addendum page with a bill of lading uh, to describe our hazardous materials. And a shipping paper can be in any format we want. You know, I could write it out on a bar napkin if I wanted to. As long as I put all the required information on that paperwork, it's acceptable. As long as we have all the required information on that page, it doesn't matter what format it's in. As far as the regs go, it's an acceptable shipping paper. Segregation, but we looked at all the products that we ship out of here and there's no requirements as far as segregation goes. So there's no incompatible classes of hazardous materials that we have, so we don't have to worry about separating things. But that doesn't mean if, you know, if we add a new product line and it's a, you know, something that's not compatible with some of the other products we ship, then we may have to segregate. Once we reach a certain amount of hazardous material on a truck, we've got a placard for that in vehicles. You know, we have three different products like the non-flammable gas, the flammable liquids, and the corrosives. So if you have three placard holders and you know, you've got a, a total of you know, 1,200 pounds consolidated, uh, then placard for each different class. So, you know, the main thing I want you to, uh, to get out of this is being able to identify what a hazardous material is.